Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, uh, good morning. My name is Marcus, and for those of you who are watching online, it's a great time to have you. I'm glad you're here. If you're ever in the area, please come over and visit us here at Crossroads Church, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. We are in a series right now entitled uh, The Call, and so it's been getting some traction. Actually, I got a, a video sent from a grandmother uh, uh, with her grandchild, and the grandchild started trying to call Jesus, asking for Siri. Hey, Siri, call Jesus. And so I, we, I think we got a little video, so let me just show you right quick. Jesus. Hey, Siri, call Jesus. Hey, Siri, call Jesus. Hey, Siri, call Jesus. Hey, Siri, call Jesus. Call him up. Isn't that cute? I love that. I love that whole idea. So we are in our series. This is our fourth talk in our series, and uh, we've been uh, hearing some rings, and we've been hearing some calls to come, to come and see, to come and learn about humility, to come and understand how Jesus walked this earth, to come and follow him. Because it's not only um, a calling just to believe in him, but also to behave like him as well. All right. And so the calling continues. But before we get into this message, this is going to be a difficult message for some. Actually, it is for me as well. But I've got to lighten it up a little bit. So little Johnny went to sleep. And he dreamt that he got a call and his uncle Bill had died. So he wakes up the next morning and later that evening the dad uh, gets a call and guess what? Little, not little Bill, but Bill had passed away. Uncle Bill had passed away. Johnny goes to sleep the next morning. He wakes up and he had dreamt that night that he got a call and his aunt Joy had died and passed away. And so the next day that evening the dad gets a call again. And Aunt Joy had passed away. And little Johnny's kind of freaking out. He goes, Dad, he goes, you know, man, this is crazy. He goes, but uh, two nights ago, I dreamt that Uncle Bill was going to die. And then yesterday, I dreamt that Aunt Joy was going to die. And it's come to pass. And Dad's like, oh, Johnny, that's just a coincidence. Don't worry about it. Just go to school and then go to sleep tonight. So he does. And that next night, he has another dream. Wakes up the next morning. He goes, Dad, I had a dream that my dad died. And he's freaking out. And so Johnny goes off to school, dad goes off to work, and he's in, he had the worst day at work in his entire life. He was all nervous, and he was, didn't even have lunch because he's thinking maybe somebody will poison him or whatever. So he's all nervous and racked up about it. So he's driving home. He drives slow, making sure there's no wrecks or anything. And he gets to the house, and his wife opens up the door. Hey, how's your day? He goes, well, man, it's a whole lot worse. It was horrible. I was so nervous. It's probably a whole lot more worse than yours was. And she says, I don't know. I got a call today. And the milkman died on the porch today. (sighs) You guys got it. Good. Thank you. So in this series, we've been getting rings. We've been getting calls. We've been getting uh, questions that are coming from that call uh, to come and see, like I said, to come and see the mess that Jesus dove into whenever he came on this earth. You know, when he came, he came into a messy world just like he came into our messy world. There's another calling to come and learn, to come learn how I acted in this mess. I acted with humility. And it was the call to, to come and learn how to humble ourselves and walk in the manner that he walked on this earth. And then last week we talked about how to come and follow, that following is more than just believing. Following is learning how to behave like I behaved on this earth. And today there's a calling It's another calling. It's coming our way. It's a call that every single believer, everyone who calls himself a true follower of Jesus will get. It's a calling that goes something like this. Hey, Marcus, I want you to come and not only see what I've done and not only learn what I've done, not only follow, but I want you to come and and die like I did. I want you to come and deny yourself like I did. Danny, Bill, John... I want you to come and lay your wants down. I want you to come and lay down you being right all the time. I want you to come and lay your dreams down. I want you to come and deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after me. The title of this morning's message is, Come and Die. 
come and die. Uh, and it's a lengthy topic. I mean, we could sit here for the next month or two and talk about this because the scripture is full of uh, this particular topic. And so I spent 12 hours yesterday kind of wrestling through, like, how, how am I going to do this in 30 minutes, Lord? And I decided that it was the simplest way for me to do it is to address two deaths. One is a death, a physical death, a dying physically. That's for the gospel's sake. That's the ultimate sacrifice. But there's another death. It's a dying daily for others' sake. It's a daily sacrifice that takes place in our lives. Bill and I were talking, one of our elders here, and you know, I was reminded of the daily sacrifice that a married couple has to go through. You know, marriage is like a three-ring circus is what I tell people. you got your engagement ring, you got your wedding ring, and then you got suffering. <laughs> right? And what I mean by that is that there is a suffering. There is a selfishness that has to be denied in our walk as we are married with our spouses. Constantly. And so it's the call to come and die. Now, here's the bottom line. You don't fear dying physically when you're used to dying daily. You don't fear dying physically if you're used to getting into the habit of learning how to die and deny yourself on a daily uh, basis. But let's talk about these two. First of all, dying physically. That's the ultimate sacrifice. The Apostle Paul gives us a really good explanation. When the disciples heard that Paul was about to go enter into some suffering moments and actually get imprisoned, you know, they began to just try to warn him, don't go, don't go. And the Apostle Paul says this in Acts the 21st chapter. He goes, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his posture. That was his attitude. That was his approach to death. He was anticipating death as a follower of Christ. Later on, he writes in 1 Timothy, he says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure, it's here. I have fought the good fight. I have learned to die every single day. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And a little bit afterwards, Paul was martyred to death by a Roman emperor, Nero. He was a Roman citizen. And because he was a Roman citizen, a Roman citizen doesn't get uh, crucified. He got beheaded. And not only Paul, but there are several others that were martyred, that died physically for the gospel's sake. People like James, Jesus' brother, 94, he was beaten, stoned by Jews, and finally had his brains dashed out with a fuller's club. Fuller's club is just like a little billy club that used to, you know, used to clean um, like blankets or clothing and stuff like that. At 94 years old, you, man, you imagine your grandfather getting beat on the head until his brains come out? How would you respond? You'd take matters into your own hands, right? Matthias, the one that was elected to take the place of Judas, uh, he was stoned at Jerusalem, and then he was beheaded himself. Andrew, the brother of Peter, he was taken and crucified on a cross, the two ends of which were fixed diagonally on the ground, that was the beginning of that term, St. Andrew's Cross. Look it up. St. Mark, the writer, he was uh, born of Jewish parents of the tribe of Levi. Mark was dragged into pieces by the people of Alexandria before their idol, ending his life under the merciless hands. Peter, during the reign of the emperor Nero, he was crucified with his head downward, upside down, at his own request. He goes, I'm not worthy to die the death of, like my Lord. Turn me upside down. Luke, the evangelist, was hung on an olive tree by an idolatrous priest of Greece. John, the beloved disciple, the one, you know, that was closest to him, was sent to Rome where he was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil. He should have died, but he escaped by a miracle without an injury. He was sentenced, uh, they sentenced him to slave labor in the Isle of Patmos. That's where he had a vision and he wrote the book of Revelation. He was later freed due to an old age and returned to a modern day Turkey and died as an old man. He was the only apostle who escaped the violent death and died peacefully. I wonder if that is connected to how he was behaved whenever he was walking this earth, where love was dominating his life. Only God knows. Listen, Crossroads, we stand on the shoulders of men and women like this, those who are willing to die physically to do what we do today, to do what I do today, which is to share the gospel of Christ. Jim Elliott, who's another martyr, another missionary who was martyred, he said it this way. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. 
I like to say it this way. I can't lose if I willingly give away what was never meant for me to keep for myself anyways. Isn't that great? Let me give you one more. A guy by the name of Ignatius. End of the first century, he was a bishop of the church of Antioch. History says that, remember when Jesus came and you hear the story when Jesus picked up little children and put them on his lap and he said, for such is the kingdom of God is this. History says that one of those children that he picked up was this man right here, Ignatius. He was discipled by John himself, the apostle. He ministered the gospel before the emperor. And then Ignatius was taken by the Romans to, out to be martyred. But before they went out to go get martyred, he made this statement right here. He wrote this. He goes, grant me this favor. I know what's best for me. Now I'm beginning to be, now I'm beginning to be a disciple. Fire and cross and battles with beasts, mutilation, being torn apart, scattering of bones, mangling of limbs, grinding of the whole body, cruel tortures of the devil. Let these come upon me only that I may reach Jesus Christ. Neither the ends of the earth nor the kingdoms of this age will be of benefit to me. It is better for me to die in Christ Jesus than to reign over the ends of the earth. Allow me to be an imitator of the suffering of my God. That's powerful, isn't it? And after he writes, they take him. Scourgely, they beat him. He was compelled when he's on his way to hold fire in his hands. And at the same time, they would uh, put papers that were dipped in oil and they would put them to the side and then they would start him on fire. It was like a flaming torch walking. His flesh was being torn. And while he was being torn, they would take these, um, what do you call it, like, like pinchers. And they would go and scrape his body. And at last he was murdered, being torn to pieces by wild beasts. That's who we stand on the shoulders of. That's we... I had to share about the physical part of it because I needed to honor those who have died and answered the call so that I can get to do what I get to do here in this city. Amen. Now here's what I know about every single one of us in this room. This whole idea of coming to die, it's a little bit too much for our Western Christianity, isn't it? Man, we have no clue what's gone before us. If authority rises up right now, we fight, we protest, we challenge, we criticize, we complain, we push back. After all, we're in it to win it. After all, it's our right to do so. But remember this, first, Christ, first century Christians, they gave up those rights. Jesus was Lord of their life. Not just a part of it, not just the public part, but every single part of their lives. Not just when everything was right, but when everything was wrong, he was Lord over their lives. They not only believed in Jesus, but they behaved like Jesus. There were tremendous injustices that took place in that day. And there's injustices that take place in our free world today. But our injustices that we face, the stuff that we see on the TV, the stuff we experience in the courtrooms, wherever else, it's never an excuse to forsake the new covenant mandate, to love like Christ loved to the very end. As a matter of fact, our Christian faith is anchored to a horrific injustice. You remember the worst possible thing, a crucifixion happened to the best possible person, a Christ. That's the foundation of what we do. That's the foundation of what we believe. It's built there. It's built upon the words of Jesus that says, whoever wants to be my disciple, he is going to have to deny himself, take up this cross daily, and follow me. Follow him where? Where are you going, Jesus? I'm going to the back of the line. Follow me there. That's where Ignatius is. That's where Peter is. That's where John is. Where are you going, Jesus? I'm going to walk in the way of love. Like my father taught me to walk in the way of love. That sounds soft to some. Sounds like a Christian with a pink shirt and weak-willed and soft-spoken individual. Bless you. Shows your weakness, Delilah. <laughs> it's far from weak. That kind of approach to life is far from weak. Weak, a man who was willingly uh, there hanging on a cross, spilling over with all his body fluids, 
dripping down his body and his intestines being exposed to everyone who saw them. That's not weak. That's a sign of strength that we have no idea. Oh, isn't that the truth? When we answer the call, when, whenever you say yes to this call that he's asking us to be a part of, the image should not be, the image that we should see, the, the image that should capture our heart in the very beginning should not be that of a warrior that craves for controversy, but it should be that of a disciple, of a follower who controls his passions. Amen. Who's able to say no to his flesh, and yes, I'm going to take the high road, the high road of mercy that my father has taught me, that Christ has lived before us. I agree. Dying physically, it's a little bit too much this Sunday morning in Seguin, Texas. So, let's move forward. Let's talk about dying daily. Is that all right? Luke's gospel, the ninth chapter. Luke's gospel, Jesus said it this way. We start with Jesus and his words, and it says this. He says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. To deny yourself is to forget oneself, to lose sight of oneself and one's own interests. I love how the Passion Translation says it. The Passion Translation says that if you truly want to follow me, you should at once completely reject and disown your life. And you must... Be willing to share my cross and experience as, as if it's your own. As you continually surrender to my ways. For you choose, if you choose self-sacrifice and lose your lives for my glory, you will continually discover true life. But if you choose to keep your lives for yourselves, you're going to forfeit what you're going to try and keep. Dying daily is a serious issue. Dying daily is a scriptural issue. Dying daily is our issue. So how do we die daily? Practically, Marcus, show me, Pastor, how do I die daily? Well, I'm going to try to explain that to you this morning. But before I do, before I show you how, I need to show you why. I need to share with you why we have to die daily. Here's why. Because the church, the ecclesia, the big picture, the big church, the church serves as a conscience to our nation. We are a visible destination of which our culture will hopefully end up in because of what they see. We serve like a commercial for coming attraction. This idea of dying daily is really, when you look at it in practical terms, it's, it's how we behave when stuff doesn't go our way. You and I, in our lives, we're a trailer. We're an advertisement of what people should want to attend in days or weeks to come. You ever seen trailers? It's like, man, it moves you. It's like, I got to go see that. You buy tickets, you buy tickets for everyone. Well, our lives should be that transparent. It should be a trailer like that. Let me put scripture to this idea. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, the first verse. It says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, since we're surrounded, people are watching us. People like Ignatius and Peter and Stephen and Paul, all those that have gone before us, all those who have, you know, even mom, who just in her final day on this earth, read scripture and worshiped the one who created her. She's looking on. Your grandfather's looking on. People who love Christ and they've gone before us, they're looking on. Since we're surrounded by so great of a cloud of witnesses, people who set an example for us, because let us lay aside every weight and sin that easily ensnares us. Can we just throw those things? Can we just throw everything that divides us? Can we have the courage and the strength to just lay aside those things that cause us to form categories and classifications in our culture? Everything we deserve because we're right? Are we willing to lay those things? It says, let every weight and every sin that ensnares us, let those things lay them aside. And let us what? Do run with endurance, the race that is set before us. This race that you and I are running right now, it's already been marked out. This race has already been lived out by a handful of followers that showed us not only how to believe and what to believe, but how to behave. Looking unto Jesus, it goes on to say. Looking unto Jesus, keeping our eyes fixed, keeping our gaze fixed. Where is the church's eyes on today? It says, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Do you know that your life flows 
Your life flows in the direction of your most predominant thought. It flows in the direction of what's filling your mind the most. In other words, what you stare at determines uh, what you gravitate towards. Whatever you're keeping your eyes fixed on, you have a tendency to go. You know, we used to ride those things, baby. Remember when we went? What do you call those things? You just hop on and you just go? What do you call those? Segways. Yes, they are dangerous. I'm telling you. <laughs> the direction they gave me, we were at the, at the Colorado, what do you call that thing? Garden of, the gods. Garden of the Gods. My wife was in front of me, and she didn't know how to drive those things. I didn't either. I'm like, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. But then they said, look in the direction that you want to go. And when I started doing that, it would just go that way. It's just like magic. It's like, what in the world? Our life flows in the direction of our most, whatever we're looking at, whatever we're fixed to, it says, keep your eyes on Jesus. What's the church focused on? What's the church keeping their eyes on? What is it? Winning? Believing right? A creed that's correct? A doctrine that divides? We have to be careful, church, that we're not careful. We'll lose our voice. We'll lose our our influence here on this earth. He says, looking unto Jesus, let us orient our eyes, let us orient our heart on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. When our eyes are fixed on him, on his words, on his actions, when our gaze is so settled on how he lived his life, his attitude, how he responded, how he reacted, ultimately, if our eyes are fixed on him, it'll conform our lives. It'll, it'll, it'll affect our, how we live this life on this earth. Then, when we get used to doing that, behaving that way, and dying daily to those things, then what John wrote in 1 John will come to pass, where he says, as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. So why do we die daily? Because I need my grandson to see it. Because I, see, I need to see my kids see it. I need to see my neighbor see it. I need to see our community see it. I need to see my enemy see it. That's why we die daily. Now, how do we do? How do we die daily? Three things I need you to keep in remembrance. Three things. One is deny. Two is crucify. And three is apply. Deny, crucify, and apply. This is how you die daily. Let's talk about this. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him do what? Deny himself. To deny means to disown, to lose oneself, to forget oneself, to lose one's sight of his own interests. We don't get to pick and choose what we want to keep and what we want to let go of. You ever gone um, in your own closet because you're trying to do some spring cleaning and you want to get rid of stuff to go and take it to the Goodwill? And you go in there and you open it up and it's like, "Ah, I don't want that. I don't need that. But you can't get a hold of that. I need that. I need to hold on to this. Anybody ever done that? Usually the thing that you hold on to the most is the thing that you probably need to let go of. But we don't get to pick and choose what we're going to hold on to. It says you have to deny yourself. Deny yourself of what, Pastor? Man, there's so many scriptures that talk about this. Deny yourself of what? Of your own right. Your own right to do what? To take revenge when you feel like taking revenge. To keep a good reputation like Kim was talking about. I don't want to be that Jesus follower in the birthday party. People are going to talk about here. Who's that skinny little girl? Jesus. (laughs) Crazy girl. You lose your right to hold on to a reputation. You lose your right to keep, to spend money however you want to. You deny your right to hate your enemy, to be honored and served, to understand God's plan before you obey God's plan. You lose your right to live by your own rules. You lose your right to complain. You lose your right to go hold on to grudges. You lose your right to put yourself first. You lose your right to rebel against authority when they aren't making laws that comply with you and your will and your ways. And your desires, you lose your right to play house and experiment sexually with whoever. I'm meddling now, and I know that. That's what you lose your right. In the words of Eminem, 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 whatever his name is, lose yourself. You got to lose yourself. We should have played that song. You got one shot. 
one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted. I couldn't sing it, but I mean, Jeremiah could. You got to lose yourself in the music. <laughs> but you ever, you know, you think about that song, you lose, you lose, you ever lost yourself in the music? I mean, you're just like jamming on your headphones and you're just like, you're all in it. You could see the band, you could see the drummer playing. What does he mean? You're all in. You go all in. To lose yourself, to deny yourself, you go all in. You lose yourself. You go all in to what he's asking you to do. You follow him. You deny yourself and go all in and, 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 and follow him with all your heart. Yeah. Not just half of it. Not just the, the public part on Sunday. All of it. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Amen. Hey, Siri. Call Jesus. One, deny. Two, crucify. Say crucify with me. It says, take up his cross daily. Who has control of the action? We do. We have control of this thing called crucifixion. But, but, let me just pause and say this. You don't have control, in a sense, with your own self-will, with your own self-determination, with your own self-effort. Big difference. As a matter of fact, the scripture says in Isaiah, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. I love what the apostle Paul says, Galatians 2.20, he goes, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but who lives? But Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live on this earth, I live, the inner man, the new man, the born again man, I live by faith in the son of God who gave himself. For me, I am crucified with Christ, yet not I, but the greater one that's on the inside of us. We could do a whole series on this passage, a whole series on just understanding what it means to live victorious over the addictions and the habits of the stuff that we contend with with our flesh. He empowered you. Listen, the New Testament born again experience is so absolutely you. He it's so absolutely powerful. We, our mind can't even comprehend. He not only delivered you from the penalty of sin, but also the power of sin, the dominion of sin. You don't have to yield yourself to it. Romans 8 chapter says it this way. If you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. The way we try to overcome our addictions is by our own will, you just got to do this every day. You just got to say no to this every day. And you think about it from the sun up to sundown. And because you think about it so much, guess what? You just walk right into it. But he says, by the Spirit, let him empower you first. Let him fill you with what he's already given you and what he's already provided to you in Christ Jesus. And then, in other words, if you put the God side first, it'll make the man side a whole lot easier. Just by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body. Then you're going to live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You didn't receive the spirit of bondage to fear. You received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit of bondage always focuses on what you are going to do, but the spirit of adoption always focuses on what God has already done for you. Big, big difference. And that's the fight that Paul was talking about. I have fought the good fight of faith. I have fought the faith, the faith to remain that, to, to, to understand and hold on to the thing that God did in my life was enough. I don't fight for my victory. I fight from my victory. Big, big difference, right? Let me tell you two truths about crucifixion or when uh, the individual that's actually doing the crucifying, not that I have any, you know, uh, experience with that, but two things about people who are actually doing the crucifying. One, it's brutal. It's ruthless. One, it's intentional. It's so aggressive. It's so, the determination's on the inside of them. You can't go in there and approach, you can't go in there and say, I'm going to halfway crucify you. There's a commitment involved. There's an unwavering, resolute, determined attitude, mindset that has to take place to follow through with it. Your mind's got to be a little crazy. One, it's brutal. Two, it's painful. And those two qualities is how your fight is going to take place. The fight to remain in faith, it's got to be intentional, it's got to be determined, it's got to be resolute, but it's also going to hurt. 
It's also going to hurt you. Why? Because I love Whataburger. <laughs> Why? Because I want to yield. Oh, but he's so fine. He's winking his eye at me. Yeah, but he's married, man. He's married. Come on. We went out, we went out witnessing to the projects. We call the local projects down by the park. And uh, Mark was our worship pastor back then. And Mark was like, goes up to this guy. And this guy started sharing his heart and his heart. And he goes, man, he goes, I'm just, you know, I'm having a problem. He goes, what's the problem? He goes, man, there's this girl that really, really likes me. You know, and I really want to marry her. And I really want to, I think she's the one for me. He goes, oh, really? So what's the problem? I don't get it. He goes, well, the problem is I'm married to this other gal already. I'm like, dude, really? That's the kind of stuff we deal with. Deny. Crucify, and the last one is apply. Apply. When he says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and do what? Follow. Follow me. In other words, Jesus is saying, follow me. Follow me. Follow me how I think. Follow me how I speak. Follow me the way that I live. <clears throat> when you don't know what Jesus said, when you don't understand what Jesus said, just look up a little bit further and, and, and see what he did says, follow me. You know, it's very easy for us to take the path of least resistance, isn't it? It's very easy for us. Path of least resistance is when we complain about everything but do nothing about anything. And as a follower of Jesus, I am compelled. As a follower of Christ, I'm compelled. I'm earnestly compelled on the inside to love like him, to be involved in people's mess. There are times when I'm like, I'm tired of everybody's mess. I just want to go. Let's go on vacation. We go to vacation in another city. There's another mess. I told you last week, we just grabbed, we just got off the plane, and we just grabbed some water burger, and it was awesome. We had fries. We had onion rings and all that. And I go to the stop sign, and there's a guy right there by the window. I want some food, man. I'm like, now he's like, you better give me your fries. I'm like, I don't want to. <laughs> I'm compelled to bear another person's burdens. I'm compelled by the Spirit of God to dive into people's mess because the one who called me, called me when I was in my mess, called me when I was hurt and broken and wounded and destroyed my life and my family's life. And as I see that around me, it's like I'm compelled by his Spirit to, to act like him and to live like him and to speak like him and to involve myself in other people's lives. Yesterday I was at a crossroads and had someone come to my house. I came face to face with an individual who betrayed me, an individual who has lied to me, an individual who's stolen from me. I was at a crossroads to give her a piece of my mind. I had the right to do so or to lay down my rights and to feed my enemy, and to love, and to embrace, and to lift up the standard that I see right here in Scripture. I can't step over that. I can't step to the side. I can't oppose my own heart. And if I'm not careful, I'll, 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 I'll go everywhere and anywhere and think I can, uh, you know, I'm a solution to everyone's problems, but that's one thing that I can't do also. I can't solve the world's problems. Jesus didn't either. As a matter of fact, when Jesus came here on this earth, the system was a mess. It needed to be fixed just like it needs to be fixed now. But Jesus didn't come to fix the system. He came to address something a whole lot more different. He came for a different purpose. He came to address the hearts of those that had actually broke and messed up the system. He came to address the hearts that were behind the system. He said it this way, out of the heart... Come evil thoughts and murders and adultery and sexual immorality and thievery and false testimony and slander. These are the things that defile an individual. When you look at the scripture, Jesus, when he came here on this earth, it says that he was full of grace, but he was also full of truth. In other words, when he was here, he addressed the matters of the heart, but he also addressed the needs of those who had been shattered by their own corrupt hearts. The woman caught in adultery. 
He addressed her. Grace and truth. Grace, I don't, I don't condemn you either, but go and sin no more. He didn't fix the system. Hey, that system's messed up. How did you know she was an adulterer? Were you there? Do you understand what I'm saying? He didn't fix the system. That's why he said, when you look at Scripture, when you read it, if you, seen the, if you see me, you see how I address lives, you see the Father. You want to know who my father's heart is? Watch what I do. He says, if you see me, you've seen the father. So you want to know what the fulfilling of the call looks like? It looks like this. It looks like the words of Jesus, and he says, watch me. Listen to me, and then follow me. Follow me. Answer his call. So what do I do? Well, it's on your lap now. It's off of my hands. It's on your lap. Answer the call. We all have a choice. Let me just conclude with this one uh, more story. You and I can either live for our own purposes or for his purposes, our own pleasure or his purpose on this earth. We have a choice to make. There's a guy by the name, there's a story of a Roman emperor named Charlemagne. Charlemagne is an interesting legend that took place about this particular emperor. Legend has it that he had asked to be entombed, sitting upright on his throne. He asked that a crown would be placed upon his head and a scepter in his hand. And he requested uh, that a royal cape be draped around his shoulders and an open book would be placed upon his lap. And that was in A.D. 814. 200 years later, an emperor, another emperor, determined to see if that burial request actually had been carried out. So he had some a team of men open up that tomb and make a report. And they found the body of this emperor, Charlemagne, just like he had requested. Only now, two centuries later, the scene was gruesome. The crown was tilted, the mantle was moth-eaten, and the body was disfigured. But open on the skeletal legs and thighs of of this man was a book, just like he requested It was the Bible. And it was open to a passage. And a bony finger was pointing to this passage in Matthew, the 16th chapter, that says, What good is it? Will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his own soul? What good is it if I fight all my life and look for the interest of just me, moi, and my little family, What good is it if I gain everything that I had my right to and forfeit eternal things? What good is it? Let's answer his call. Not only to come and see, not only to come and learn, not only to come and follow, but to come and die. To lay our lives down for something way bigger, way stronger, much more beautiful than we can ever even imagine to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow him. Amen? Let me pray with you. Father, we just thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Master, we just ask that you forgive us for allowing our lives sometimes just to be so consumed with just ourselves. I pray that only by your spirit would you provoke us and poke at us and remind us remind us of the things that we have read in scripture the things that we've seen in scripture regarding how you conducted yourself how you dove into the mess and you didn't condemn or shame people but you embraced them as an individual addressed their mess with your goodness to lay our lives down so we can serve the bigger picture. So we just trust you. We commit that to graces this week as we interact with those that we love and those that we don't love. In Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said, amen. Amen. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. 
May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.